Okay. So good evening, everyone. This is a Situate Harbor Resiliency Master Plan Task Force meeting. Um, on this meeting, we have several task force members. We've, we're recording the meeting so we can post it on the project website and share it uh, more widely than those participating this evening. From MAPC, we have Christian Brandt, myself, Josh Fiala, Darcy Schofield, and then it looks like from the task force, we have Penny Scott Pipes, Rick Murray, Luis Pafun Villainy, Linda Ferguson, Kyle Boyd, and um, Charlotte Britton on the call. So it looks like that's our attendees in total now. So thank you all for making the time this evening. I, I don't think it'll be too long of a, of a meeting, but we did want to touch base with you all uh, for the primary purpose of introducing you to the draft plan, which has been produced, and to um, invite your feedback over the next few weeks uh, as you're able to provide us comments or suggestions for making it an even better plan. Cal, did you have something you wanna say? All right. So we'll keep going. So let me just uh, give you guys a brief introduction. You know everything well, but just for those who might not be as familiar with the process, uh, MAPC has been working with the town. You see our faces here on the screen, uh, those members of the team. So you've seen myself, Darcy and Christian at a lot of the meetings throughout this process. Kyle has been our, our closest um, coordinator from the town's perspective, the coastal management officer there for the situate uh, staff. We've been at this with you all for about a year now. We started around May of uh, last year, 2019, and now we're into June of 2020, of course. Uh, and through that time, we've had uh, pretty significant engagement with the community, starting with some task force meetings, having uh, several community forums, uh, meeting with people in the district itself, uh, working with you all. I think this is our sixth meeting now, if I'm remembering them all correctly. Uh, so thank you all again for your uh, involvement in this process, a very important process. Uh, and we think that our, the draft document because of this process reflects where the community's at in regard to Situate Harbor. And we're very thankful for everyone's input into making it such a strong effort. So the task force really deserves quite a bit of thanks at this point for all the time you've devoted uh, in, in your involvement. This is the full task force. Not all the members are on the call this evening, but we'll share this video out to those who couldn't join us tonight so that they can see and get a feel for the recommendations themselves. Um, I won't read down the list, I'll just keep on moving along. So we uh, have been at this for, for obvious reasons. Uh, Situate Harbor is the heart of the community in many ways. Many people see it as a, a very important asset of the community. The Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Plan uh, that uh, Darcy helped prepare uh, with the town uh, a couple years ago, identified Situate Harbor as the top priority in terms of resilience uh, efforts that need to be undertaken for the town. You see on the screen evidence of, of uh, the flood risks uh, in the Cole Parkway area and then on Front Street. So that was just a couple years ago. Um, and then what we heard through the community's uh, response to this process is that they agree. Um, what was your main concern for Situate Harbor? Uh, there's a lot of concern, of course, about the types of things to do in Situate Harbor, so the businesses, the shops, and the restaurants. And I imagine that would be, uh, those types of concerns are only increased because of the circumstances we're on with uh, COVID-19 and thinking about how those local businesses are continuing to survive. Then the other uh, main uh, uh, portion of that pie is uh, flood risks. So you see 32% think that that's the, the main concern for Citroen Harbor and it being a thriving coastal business district into the future. And then uh, how urgent do people feel about the flood, uh, addressing the flood issues? Uh, and many people felt it was uh, most urgent, uh, something that should be accomplished uh, with uh, due diligence. Uh, others thought that it was urgent or moderately urgent and then only just a few urgent and none at all actually think it's a, a less urgent issue that needs to be tackled. The study is built upon uh, current flood risks, the FEMA mapping, but also projecting flood risks uh, out to 2038 and 2088, uh, looking at sea level rise as a contributing factor to that flood risk. 
uh, and understanding how those impacts uh, can be mitigated, mitigated with uh, uh, incremental investments uh, on the coastal edge of the district. So we, through the process and through all those conversations over that uh, year with the committee or the commu committee and the community, uh, we've defined this problem statement uh, to create a cohesive vision for Citra Harbor that will build resilience incrementally through coordinated and layered measures to meet flood challenges projected for mid-century and beyond. Near-term and long-term actions should create more flood resilience while creating additional benefits to the district uh, that reflect a lot of the other uh, ambitions that we heard from the community. So enhancing economic vitality, improving the public realm, strengthening community and civic gathering, improving district parking, maintaining cost effectiveness, retaining the ability to implement and reducing negative impacts of those actions. So we've kept that uh, at the center point of the problem we're trying to solve and hopefully the solutions in the final document do reflect uh, this problem statement. As a part of the process, we had a inventory of resilient solutions that were presented to the community at a forum uh, and asked the community to weigh in on what they thought were the most appropriate types of solutions. Uh, and that resulted in this chart here. So we've asked that question at the community forum. We asked that question at task force meetings. We asked that question at um, focus group meetings. And the, these three were the, the most uh, sort of resounding uh, options that people wanted to examine. Ocean fortification uh, is the type of solution that looks at some sort of structure uh, in the, out in the harbor. Uh, so similar to the example we've been using is the New Bedford hurricane barrier. So it would be something that perhaps builds up the jetties out at the mouth of the harbor and uh, introduces something like a floodgate to control uh, those storm surge uh, and uh, rising sea uh, impacts. A, another alternative that the community preferred was looking at the coastal harbor edge and elevation of that edge uh, where the district meets the water uh, and thinking about the uh, extension of some of the existing conditions that are already there, such as the bulkheads, the seawalls, uh, the revetments. And then the last was looking at land fortification, which is moving to the land side of that edge and thinking about ways to elevate uh, the uh, district in such a way that you might create more uh, coastal amenities or attractions to bring people into the district. So those were the three that we looked at in more detail. You can see additional depictions of those three on the screen now. Uh, and we did a high level evaluation of these three so that we could zero in on uh, one or two or a combination of them that made sense to outline in detail in the document which you have uh, released now as a draft. Um, in, in this analysis, which we used a comparative analysis between these three options, actually using the problem statement as a way to evaluate the three of them, uh, that, that analysis was presented back to the community again, and then the community, uh, after seeing that analysis, was asked to give their preferences at that point. The analysis in summary form is shown here, uh, where we just did a, a numerical ranking of those three options compared to each other. So if one was better suited relative to the uh, enhancing economic vitality um, metric, for example, then that would get the one. If it was the, the middle, uh, it would get the zero in terms of being neutral. And then if it was the, the least um, beneficial of the three, it would get the negative one. So we went across each of those metrics and this is how that all played out. The uh, major uh, water-based infrastructure investment had, had a lot of um, uh, negative uh, aspects to it to overcome. We shared those in, in detail with the community. Uh, and then what the community told us at that meeting resoundingly was that the preference uh, in light of that information was actually uh, toward alternatives B and C. So they, they liked looking, uh, focusing more on the district itself, focusing on the edge of that district and perhaps seeing if a, uh, a new amenity could, uh, could be developed or a series of amenities developed through these resilience improvements. So we thought that was uh, a very good uh, progress in that conversation with the community and a very good place for the community to end up. So the final report, which I'll just outline here for you now, um, it, it, it recounts everything that I just laid out in summary fashion uh, in, in greater detail. 
uh, and it goes through that process which was used to arrive at um, the preferred solutions. Uh, you can see some of those uh, pages illustrated on the screen now. Hopefully you all have this PDF. Uh, if not, we can send it out again, but it's also on the project website. Uh, if you Google Situate Harbor Resiliency, it'll be the first, first option that comes up, I believe. Um, and it's also, uh, the website is hosted by ours. So it's a mapc.org website. And that's, I believe is later on in this presentation. So you can have that. Uh, so this, it, it outlines a lot of the detail. The outline for the report is here. We have an overall summary. We introduce, uh, again, the background and context of this process, why it's important. The process we went through to get to these recommendations, which I've just outlined, um, Darcy's done some fantastic work uh, on Situate Harbor coastal flood risks uh, and has uh, uh, contributed quite a bit to uh, the detailed analysis in terms of uh, the flood risk itself, uh, what the infrastructure risks are for the district, doing a bit of uh, analysis in terms of where those uh, infrastructure risks are in or just around the district uh, and what we can be doing uh, to set ourselves up for success. Uh, the coastal resilience solutions outline uh, those three alternatives in, in a little more detail. And then the meat of the work is, is really what's highlighted in those two blue sections. So this, the section called Situate Harbor Resilience Master Plan is actually the uh, result of that process, which is outlined at the beginning of the report uh, and has it, that vision statement, which I've shared with you this evening. Uh, and then details in, in a little uh, more depth, plan objectives that are uh, intended from this master plan. And then it outlines a series of concrete recommendations by objective uh, and then by sub area as well. So we tried to drill down uh, geographically and really get into the district and, and tried to think in concrete ways about what the recommendations look like for each part of the Situate Harbor Business District. And then finally, we have some um, complementary recommendations and sustainability recommendations that relate to zoning, uh, some zoning suggestions, both for resilience and for sustainability. Uh, and then also um, some longer term zoning uh, prospects such as expanding the business district uphill uh, into the residential, what is currently zoned a residential area. Uh, and that would allow potentially the opportunity for some migration of certain business uses as well. Uh, and uh, with the notion that the, the Situate Harbor will be a valuable uh, water asset for the, the harbor moving forward, but certain uses might not need to be located there in the future. So all of that is outlined in great detail. And then we also, in the final section, uh, did prioritize what we thought were good implementation approaches with actions, concrete actions in a prioritized fashion uh, over the short term, near, over the near term, midterm, and long term, um, and tried to relate those to tangible things that the town can be acting upon. Just a few samples from the report. So this is a spread from that sub area um, recommendation section where you see that we've, we've zoomed in on an area of Cole Parkway and then have a series of uh, recommendation statements that tried to get pretty specific while, while still, I and mean, this is a planning study of course, um, and the, I think the, the bridge, the next step bridge in terms of actually getting some of these projects to be shovel ready would be uh, grabbing one of these sections of coastline and actually taking uh, this planning study and using it to frame an engineering study would actually give you um, something to build from. But it's, it's looking at ideas like um, uh, replacing open guardrails along that uh, edge along Situate Brook uh, with concrete barriers um, and le not letting that be an edge where water is lapping over. Uh, looking at elevating uh, the area along the gazebo and the uh, Coast Guard and Harbor Master building, uh, either in a more modest uh, park as is there today, or in an ambitious, a more ambitious waterfront park that could be a district amenity and a tourist draw uh, that builds in resilience features as well. And then uh, also looking at things uh, like uh, replacing the stone revetment with a vertical bulkhead uh, structure. That was a suggestion by the harbor master because that would potentially be associated with a, a revenue stream in the future because he would be able to 
provide more moorings in, in boat and dock space uh, that can be leased. So those, those will have to be um, sort of cost benefited out um, as this is examined. But in, a su in summary, I just wanted to show you on these aerial views here, what the collection of those more detailed recommendations start to look like for the district on a whole. So what you see here is a, a figure actually from your uh, companion coastal vision process that um, the Consensus Building Institute is leading and that we've been a part of. In the light blue tone, you see uh, 2070 sea level rise projections combined with a 10% probability storm, including the storm surge. So the edges uh, of Front Street are showing up as in that blue tone, all of Cole Parkway and Mill Wharf, uh, and then along Situat Brook and uh, across the Edward Foster Bridge and Road. So that's where, that's where that long-term flood risk is looking. I thought this was a nice figure from their work. Our, our uh, recommendations have considered the existing conditions of those coastline, again, at a, at a planning level, not at a detailed engineering level, but we've been aware of, of the, the hardened nature of the coastline within that district boundary today uh, and are using that as a starting point. But the, the basic uh, approach of those um, more detailed uh, recommendations effectively add up to something like this, where you're looking at an approach which is almost like a kind of a jigging, jogging backwards C around the district edge, which uh, through a series of either uh, enhancements to the current uh, Situate Harbor Walk to elevate that walkway uh, as part of more of a resilient edge or simply just um, extending uh, the bulkhead in some locations or adding uh, earth berms along the Situate Brook uh, uh, coast or the brook, uh, brook edge along that uh, edge of the brook or um, looking at more intensive features in the Cole Parkway area which are under the control of the town. So that, that would combine incrementally and those investments don't need to occur all at once, but that would combine with the goal of creating this um, more resilient barrier around the district that could be um, designed to even be added, added to incrementally as you're addressing uh, further increases in sea level rise over time. The second dotted line, which you see along the building edges of those buildings to the east of Front Street is um, a secondary approach, which we think is a valid one as well which would look at the flood, flood proofing the edges of those structures, some of which are already elevated. For example, the Mill Wharf condominium buildings sit on a podium uh, today and have stairs and ramps up to that podium. But if you flood proof the edges of those buildings, and this would primarily be a private property endeavor uh, for those owners, and then have deployable floodgates between those gaps in the buildings, which are, are not, um, the gaps in the buildings are, uh, relatively controllable. There's not a completely wide open area. There's the, the pedestrian alleys and some of the vehicular ways, but they're not, um, they're not unlimited openings. So you could have deployable uh, gates within those openings, have the buildings themselves act as flood barriers if they are flood proofed appropriately on that side. And then that could be a secondary protection, which wouldn't completely eliminate uh, disruption to the district in a flooding event, but it would, get, it would pro provide uh, a, a reduction of the loss in those types of events. And it would provide the, the town with a, a stopgap measure while some of those other heavier investments along the perimeter edge are occurring. So we think those two in we tandem are- question. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, Louise has a question. Oh, sorry. Hi, Hi Josh. Um, if I understand this chart or this map, so, the yellow shows, you know, the protection measures for the harbor, but all the powder blue is water everywhere, right? Correct. So I see that we're protecting the harbor, but it looks like the rest of the place is pretty inundated with water. I mean, we haven't really addressed that particularly, have we? I'm not saying you should have, but I'm just saying this is other stuff we have to be prepared for directly across from the harbor and all around it, that's all gonna be um, 
water inundation. That, that is correct, yes. So the, the primary charge in our focus study is the, the value in the business district, but you're right. Yeah. We, we tried to, I think particularly uh, troubling in the areas that are shaded so blue is Edward Foster Bridge and Road. And mm -hmm. we, we do, we have made some uh, recommendations uh, for that infrastructure in our report as well, even though it's not in the business district because it is a critical uh, point. Um, but I also think that, uh, Louise, as you're, you're well aware, the coastal visioning process is, is looking at areas beyond Situa Harbor, of course, and is, is setting up that framework and structure to think about all of the areas of the coastline um, that, that show up in this blue. And of course, if you zoomed out even more from this area that's depicted here, there's even more areas of the coastline which are blue under these circumstances. Um, so, it, and it, did you did you guys um, create this or did CBI? Because I'd love to see the whole. Do we have a vision like this for the whole situate coastline? Yeah, this this is actually from CBI's draft report, and the, in the CBI draft report, they do have the full extent of the coast. Okay, that's good. It just helps us to to understand, you know, when you fix one thing, you're, you know, you're not fixing another or whatever. So it's good to have that. I appreciate it. Sure. So we had, um, Christian Darcy and I have been thinking about how in these uh, trying circumstances we're all in and not, not many of us want to face another Zoom meeting or get another Zoom meeting invite. Uh, so we've, we've thought about how best to communicate this report and some of the recommendations out to a broader audience. And what we put together in that regard is a uh, Google Earth virtual tour, which walks people through uh, in a dynamic way with a real life aerial of the district, the recommendations of the report in a summary form. So we're, this is up on the website, this link, and you're all welcome, welcome to take a visit to it too. But it's effectively a more interactive way to engage with an executive summary of the recommendations. And let me see if I can just bring that up real quick because I'm basically at the end of this presentation. Let me stop sharing real quick. And I will reshare in a moment. And this will undoubtedly test the bandwidth of my internet connection, but so this is the interface, if you all can see that with the Google Earth. And so what it is, if, if you go to that link and you click on present, then you can walk through a series of uh, summaries about the draft report and actually go through um, step-by-step -step an introduction to what the study was about with the district boundaries, the focus on the coastal business district. Looking at the various sub areas, uh, both in the uh, aerial view, but then also having uh, a close up of those summary pages of the report. So you can review that same area. And it goes area by area um, from the Satua Brook area to the Cole Parkway area to Mill Wharf, giving a brief description of each of those sub areas. And then a diagrammatic look at the items we're highlighting in the town pier area. And then lastly is the Front Street itself. And so in addition to the resilience recommendations, we do have discussion in the report about uh, public realm and green infrastructure improvements along Front Street particularly to help with pedestrian safety and walkability, which are two things that we heard as well, loud and clear. Um, and then also have some thoughts about economic development in general uh, and ideas about 
um, storefront vacancies and the health of the local economy and those types of topics. Uh, it's worth dwelling on this slide for a moment and highlighting this, but this is an illustration of a potential future uh, in, in outlined in the report. And it, it may not be exactly uh, the type of concept that the town wants to land on, but it's, it's one, one way that those uh, resilience uh, features could come together. And what we're depicting here, um, it, and we'd be happy to hear feedback on it, because I think it is one of the more, the, one of the, uh, newer ideas, I would say, that came from our drafting of the report that hadn't necessarily been discussed in detail with the committee. Uh, but one of the things we were thinking of is, in this scenario that's depicted, the Cole Parkway area is town-owned, of course, and potentially is a, a better revenue source for the town than it is under its current, um, in, you know, design. And so one, one way to untap that uh, potential revenue source would be something like a long-term land lease for another mixed use development pad, which would be similar to what you see in one of the structures of the Mill Wharf condominium project. And so that's what you see in the, the massing of this blue building, which is next to the white Harbor Master building and Coast Guard structure. And that, that sort of arrangement might be able to then provide a little bit of revenue for some of these other improvements on the Cole Parkway uh, coastline for a new harbor, uh, new waterfront park, which uh, increases the elevation along that edge, but also provides a new landmark and destination for the community and for visitors to situate. So that's, that's the type of thinking that we tried to maybe, maybe push a little bit, uh, and this, this might be uh, a little bit visionary, but uh, we're, we're happy to uh, include it as, a, as one, one possible future and uh, how some of these might come together uh, with some real benefits to the town. And then we did uh, mention here, uh, as we, we did in, we do in more detail in the report, of course, but talk about some of the other features, Edward Foster Bridge and Road, which we just mentioned, but also the Kent Street Marshes and the importance of the Kent Street Marshes uh, in supporting the health of, the natural health of the area around the district. And then we touch on the other resilience recommendations in the report, and then ultimately refer people to the report, and then this is the website, which is uh, linked to through the MAPC uh, master page. So that, that's available today on the website, the link to the Google Earth and the link to download the full report is also there. I will pause there and see if this has sparked any questions or comments, uh, and if not, uh, the, the basic invitation is over the next few weeks to, uh, until toward the end of June, perhaps, um, we'd invite your uh, review of the report in more detail. And then uh, if you can provide comments to myself and maybe copy Kyle on those as, as you get those thoughts together. Um, we're, we're, we have our own little to-do list of items that we'd like to, we've found since the publishing of this draft that we'd like to get included into the final version as well. So we've got a few items and we'd be happy to polish it up and improve it with your uh, excellent insights. So I'll, I'll stop talking and give you all a chance to talk now. So thank you very much. Yeah, let me just jump in real quick. Um, I have another Zoom at seven o'clock. I got to get going towards in a little. I really like the effort you guys have put into making this presentable. I think the Google Earth idea is just really cool. And I just applaud you for, for doing that um, in terms of, it's just a different way of doing things and it's a very nice presentation. I'm glad you've got the link to the document itself, but I just wanted to point that out. I think I'm looking forward to going through it and I will be giving you comments, but I like the presentation style. Wanted to point that out. Great, thank you, Rick. The other thing I, I will mention is uh, one question I forgot to ask directly is if you have uh, input on uh, other meetings or presentations that would be helpful for us, uh, other settings in which we can give a similar presentation to what I just gave, we'd be all ears on that too. If it's something like the planning board or board of selectmen, if you think that would help give these recommendations some uh, additional weight, we'd be happy to do that presentation. Um, we did also present, Louise, you know, and Kyle, you know, that last week on Tuesday, we presented to the Coastal Advisory Commission. We were happy to uh, do that. 
may be useful to, ha to um, <clears throat> set a date where we do like a presentation to all the boards instead of board hopping, just because everything's virtual anyway right now. For the most part, if, uh, if we just invited all the boards to a presentation, we did that with the Stormtide Pathways where we invited like all town staff and it was really good. We had, you know, 25 people on and it, I think it's more time effective for you guys. Sounds great. You know, maybe we, we could invite conservation, planning, um, selectmen. If, if everyone on this committee thought it was all right, everyone on this task force. I think that's a great idea. As long as you don't allow discussion, you can get away. You know, no worries about open meeting law and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's a very effective way to get everybody at once. One of the things where our Zoom world in which we live these days can be quite effective and efficient. I second Rich. I think it would be good to get all the boards to see this before it's finalized. Great. We, we'll work with Kyle. I, I also applaud. I also applaud you. I think this is incredibly helpful to see the way that you put this in Google Earth. I I was shocked when I saw that. that of course, the idea of living here right in the um, Mill Wharf to see that um, that redevelopment right there, bang right where I look out my window, would be quite a shock. I haven't discussed this with anyone else um, in my building, but. I can imagine this is going to be a tough blow to think. That I, I, I like the idea, but why would we want it? First of all, we're trying to move uphill. And why would we want to put such a big building on a place where we, I, uh, I, we're trying to keep water it seems protected. And now we're putting a, a building there. I was a little surprised by that idea. Um, and wouldn't we want to build something like this higher up? And I I, I, I don't know how people at the Mill Wharf are going to feel about that, being right there between the um, Harbor Master and the Coast Guard Station. And it's pretty massive. Not anybody else Anybody else had thoughts on that, or is it just because I live here? I don't know. Thanks. My only thought on it would be that I think it's a great idea. I love the park, but I'm a little concerned parking. Everybody complains about park parking down there, and if we take away that many spaces, um, maybe St. Mary's will let us park. But I don't, park. in the next 50 years, I don't have, have a problem with put, putting a building there for even if it's only 50 years, and then Mother Nature takes it. But that's just me. Okay. Yeah, I think from a conceptual standpoint, it's phenomenal to, to earn some funding <laughs> to, to potentially protect the rest of the harbor. The details are something that would still have to be established and that would obviously take the Mill Wharf residents' concerns into consideration. It might not even be that specific location where we do that, but... Um, well, I would hope it would go way over to the side because we happen, this is where I live and I mean, I, I'm just myself and I'm way in the back on Front Street. I, I wouldn't see the harbor pretty much at all. I'd see the marsh, but it would be gone. And, and I imagine other people would feel maybe if it was moved way south um, where there aren't residents that being a resident that's, that's, that's my view and same with everyone someone on the second floor would be mm. anything so hard I mean that's pretty I don't know if that was if, if that was considered at all um, but if it was moved way south um, I, I understand I would actually prefer it was just floated out <laughs> rather than us building such a new building. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sure I know a lot of plan went into that, but um, wow, that's not something I wanna see here. Definitely yeah. write that comment down and submit it because I had the same thoughts that the building would probably be better on the other side of the lot, potentially from a view standpoint, um, so oh, that the people in the parking lot could still see the water. So I think the concept is great. The design element of it isn't like this process is more conceptual in nature. So don't, you know, think that just because it's in okay. this, okay. you know, it, it's going to right. I was trying to relax. I looked at that and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Even on the other side, though, it's like the marsh. I mean, I, I mean, that's where I spend my days, my do. Um, 
I you know, where I live and where I find my peace. But I I understand. But what, is, what have we thought about the other side on this on this here where where we met once before where the scene where, uh, uh, where the library temporarily was. Mm. Um, what what about over there where there's a building already? Hmm. And that's a beautiful spot. Um, what do we call that people now? I was the pier. Uh, community. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a great idea. Okay. Can I just say something? I don't know. Sorry. Um, the, the, you know, it's my understanding that where that building is being proposed, a lot of those spots get washed out if there's any flooding or anything anyway. So it'd be interesting to maybe see if there was some way to sort of track, you know, how many times are those spots really used, you know, where there's no other spots in the lot. I mean, I recognize that during boating season, the boaters probably park all along there, but there's plenty of spots in the parking lot. So it's, you know, at some point, I, I don't know how to do it, but, you know, have somebody maybe keep an eye. And, and the reality is- I do. I mean, I, I this is where I live. I mean, I see it all the time. I know what goes on and where people are parked. This is my whole view. But um, right now, it, it, when it's high tide, when we're going to have a high tide and people are aware enough, um, it, we know exactly where where you can park and where you can't. And the spot where that's put right now is, of course, the where most of the flooding will occur. Um, you have to go higher up and... Um, closer to CVS um, to get the drier spots. Um, and the overnight parking is always, as we talked, discussed this before, the overnight parking is where the, mostly the flood occurs. But that spot where it is right now is one of the lowest areas. But this is all going to be elevated. Yeah. Right, but um, I'm not concerned about that so much. I'm con like, if people are concerned about the loss of spots, then, yeah. you know, if we watch yeah. it, even if people are parking there now, if there's still plenty of spots in the rest of the lot, then the loss of spots is not a big a deal as we think it is, except for during, you know, say heritage days, the carnival, you know, but for the most part, if there's still empty spots there, then whether the building's there or on the other side, the, the potential loss of parking spots is not that prohibitive. It's all I'm saying. Well, so let me, uh, can I interrupt for a second? Just, um, I find this conversation interesting. And I'm, I'm interrupting for a reason. I apologize for interrupting. But it's interesting, isn't it, that this report of X number of pages that talks about the entire harbor and the business district <laughs> and several different aspects of things. And all we've talked about essentially is a conceptual uh, idea put forth about a building in a particular spot. <laughs> and I think that that's emblematic of a real problem of including that in the report because I think that would end up being the focus and would distract from the rest of the value of the report that would be offered to the community. So, and I would put this in writing, but I, I would put, I will put this in writing, but I think regardless of what one thinks about it or not, human nature being what it is and situate being what it is, it would end up being the focus of the report. And those people that don't like it, the report would get rid of everything else and toss all the babies out with the small bath water. Yeah. So my suggestion would be that you, uh, in, and, and my personal view is it would be very, very difficult to get that through the town regardless. I would, well, and I would, well. and I would instead restructure that section. And I have not read, yet read the report yeah. um, about, you know, the need to raise revenue and mm -hmm. you could decouple the location of any development because a development could be put somewhere else in the town with those proceeds being tagged or earmarked for yeah. the harbor improvement. There's no need to couple development in the town, in the harbor to those harbor needs. It could be anywhere. And so I think that's a very valuable conversation to have about the fact that there are means other than, you know, writing, uh, proposals to the state or the feds to fund this. There are other ways, such as um, tagging development for this purpose, but that development need not be in the harbor. And I really worry if you put that picture in there or you even mention it, it's going to be the focus and then it's all over. Can, 
just can I say something, Rick? First of all, I, you know, we're talking about it because it's the first time I've seen the building, but yeah. I've been to all these meetings and we've already discussed all the other stuff in the thing. So to be fair, yeah. Sure. That's part of the reason yeah. why we're talking about that is because it's fair. Yeah. I've been to these meetings. And we've talked about all the other different options and everything else. Yeah. I do think that, you know, part of whether the building's in the picture or not, the proposal we all kind of agreed on was doing that raised park. So whether you say it's a park and a park and a building, I don't think is going to change the discussion all that much. I see your point, but, but I just wanted you to know that the reason sure. why I was talking about it was because I've already, I feel like I've talked about everything else and I like everything else. And I think this is a great idea. And I think it's something that should be thrown out there. Um, and I think that when we do present it, whoever is in charge of the meeting is going to have to sort of, kind of control the discussion of it. And one of the biggest things I can see Jim Hunt sitting right there right now saying, how are you gonna pay for all this? So I think it's good that we have a potential revenue source. It could be discussed, but whoever is monitoring the meeting needs to keep the discussion of where the building is and stuff down to a minimum if it, gets, if it stays in, that would be my suggestion. Oh, sure, and I appreciate that context, but I just still, um, you know, I've been to two meetings and it's, uh, for most people who are going to be seeing the report for the first point, first point in time, I think my point stands that it will end up being the, the focus point, which I still would maintain as a risk. Yep. So I wonder, I think Josh makes a really good point here in that Cole Parkway is an untapped revenue source. And I do think yeah. that, um, you know, when we are trying to approach solutions, um, to me, if you have people gathering in a space, they're going to linger. We've talked about this, right? And then they're going to patronize businesses. So I think there's an opportunity here to think about generating revenue in a manner that's perhaps not so um, alarming, right? But I think that's, I think that's, we're on the, the right track there. I, I do hear what you're saying. I guess my concerns is that the building's in a VE zone. So that's my fault for not mentioning that to Josh earlier. Yeah. I think that would um, have some trouble getting past the way FEMA maps stand today. So even with resilience measures, so. I see, would that be the case um, on the other side at the community building where uh, existing building already stands? Um, I don't think that's in the VE zone. I think that's the biggest concern for me when you're in a high energy zone and you're having high energy hit the buildings, right? So, yeah. um, but isn't that just for new construction or is it, would an existing okay. building um, be allowed? Yeah, to, no, I mean, there's, there's certainly local bylaws. I would say as an agency, we're really trying to discourage that. Mm. Um, Say that again, Darcy, please. I'm sorry? Could you repeat that last sentence again? Yeah, so I think I think I'd have to double I think the the I think what my point here is is that the, the building was a bit alarming. Uh, we hear that. I think Josh is really is correct that this is a revenue generate and a missed opportunity for the town to generate revenue here at Cole Parkway. Um, and I think it's not through parking, to be quite frank. I mean, I, I might be a little provocative here, but I, parking is not, um, at Cole Parkway, is not the best way to get revenue. Building in that specific location could be very challenging given where it is in a VE zone. Um, even if with those protection measures that um, Josh has outlined, which would protect from like high tide and inundation. So you wouldn't have to worry about that for the building. But when you have your, your winter storm Riley's, that's when things get a little alarming. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, I think as an agency, as the Commonwealth, we're trying to move away from building in that, those, those high area zones. Um, and it might be on the edge. I don't know, Josh, it, it looked like it was close, so. I, I just wanna say, um, and I've said this several times at these meetings, I mean, I've never been to a harbor where its main feature is a parking lot. And I've been a sailor my <laughs> life. I've been to every port in New England. And it's ridiculous that our main feature is a non-revenue um, generating parking lot. So we solve the parking and we make that, it might not be a building, but it might be a bunch of clam shacks, a, a park right. for the families. Right. And, I mean, when you go to a harbor, you go to you go for a beer, you go for chowder, you go for you know, 
it's ridiculous that our main teacher is a parking lot. So I think there's a way to, it's not a spin, it's just, you know, presenting it differently is that, you know, we have to have something for the families, the tourists, the boaters, yeah. and something that um, generates revenue. And it, it may not be that building. I agree. Uh, yeah, I think there's, there is type of limited development that can happen there. Like you're saying, more pop-ups, beer gardens, like these are the kinds of mm -hmm. and innovative types of business development that can, that is really um, complementary to a park. So you can, you think about generating revenue. And I, you know, I myself, you know, I, I myself have, have very different perspective on this matter, right? I'm all about the parks. I'm all about the marshes and the open space. So I, I'll be very clear about my bias here. Um, but I think when you, when we think revenue in towns and it's uh, we have to build to get more revenue, but that, that also is a, a major expense to a town. So I think, um, so it's a matter of like of creating that balance, I think. Maybe it has to do with the way it was drawn. It shouldn't have focused on it. It seems so, so high and massive, and also in the area of the flooded. Maybe the idea of spreading the smoke out. And I'm sorry, Charlotte. I don't think we can't really hear you. I can't hear you. Can you sorry. Yeah, thank you. Can, can you hear me now? Sorry, Darcy. Can you yeah. hear me now? That? Um, maybe I shouldn't have focused on the height of that building. And first of all, I didn't. Like, um, I agree that this hasn't been something that had been discussed before, and so we've been talking about all the other details for quite a while. So that was kind of, I, I just to reiterate, I think it was a little bit of a surprise, but maybe there's some other ways to um, create something that isn't quite such a big building. I mean, it's um, and, and integrated into more of a park. Um, and you guys would be much better at how you design to show um, visually what this would look like to people. Uh, yep. uh, and, and would that produce revenue? I don't know. Um, and what kind of business is going to be in here and, and what would be revenue producing besides restaurants? Um, what kind of things are, are, do you envision there? Well, I mean, it's all up for grabs now. This is, I think we're getting too into the details right now. I mean, this yeah. will all be under discussion. Yeah, I think I think the broader point is well taken that 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 illustration will be um, controversial, and uh, we we will adjust it such that the valid points which it's trying to make are are illustrated, yeah. but that it, it's not itself the focal point because it's not intended to be. It's really just one way to imagine some outcomes, but. We can uh, we can we can fix that, and I think that's we sometimes as we're putting all this work together, we have certain blind spots. So that's the whole point of all this is for you to tell us where those blind spots are, so we can fix them. Um, I just have a different question, um, totally different. Um, you were talking about um, the flood risks and all the science that's involved in this project, and we appreciate that very much. Um, I hope in the appendix or somewhere you reference your sources because as you know at these town meetings that we sponsor people there are a lot of skeptical people and they they want to know what what study are you citing and where did you get that data so just cite your references please so that we have them. <laughs> sure uh, louise i you know i've been working with situate since 2017 since i first started mapc so every every public meeting i've had someone okay. question the science that i've used i think i think you could just plan that that will continue to happen <laughs> but um but yes we, we of course we of course you know and i will say it's really unfortunate because i was on the phone with wood's whole group yesterday i'm doing a project with them and the ad circ model is or the massachusetts flood risk model is now finally complete as we finish this project so that would actually be way better science and data than what we had but what we used is not bad data it's just uh we have there's more uh, higher resolution, better probabilistic model. So that is out there. It's coming out. But What's I it think, called? What's it called? This new called thing? the um, Massachusetts Coast Flood Risk Model. And okay. it's, it's a it's a combination of two models and some tweaks. That um, basically what it does is simulates thousands and thousands of storms after doing understanding the sort of 
and wind and currents and waves, as well as taking at 30 meter intervals information about the coastline, so topography and uh, shoreline protection structures such as salt marshes or um, seawalls, et cetera, groins, et cetera. And then it, and it simulates storms and it's in sea level rise. Uh, so it creates a probability and a depth. So it's, it's, really, it's really amazing. I get really excited mm -hmm. about it. But we have been waiting for that for three years. Woods Hole Group told me yesterday that it's ready now. So if we had that information, that's a, it's more sophisticated. But I, quite frankly, I'm going to tell you that it's probably going to be more alarming than the data that we used. Situation. Yes, that's absolutely right. Thanks. But it is all based on models. Um, and in fact, what I did for some of to get I, I did it two ways. So we wanted to look at some, for higher resolution data, there's a sort of a um, a vulnerability assessment of some of the critical infrastructure in terms of what's high priority for creating resilient strategies. So that's in the meat of the coastal resilience, uh, the coastal vulnerability. Um, so we, I looked at different depths and that's from a bathtub and swan model that was completed in 2013. But using that model, I could extrapolate different depths at 2038 and 2070. And then in that manner, it helps us prioritize which infrastructure might be more important to, um, to start first in terms of like, where do you start, right? It's all flooded, it's all blue, like you, you saw in the map that, map that Josh showed, but it's not all um, going to happen at the same time and at the same depth. So when I did the vulnerability assessment, I extracted different depths so we could prioritize which sort of infrastructure needed to be looked at first as a priority. Um, and the Kent Street Marshes, just in terms of one of your pre previous comments, was one of those that I put as a major priority for thinking about restoration. My concern is that just by mid-century, that's open water, not even mid-century, by 2038, that's open water, that's not a marsh anymore. And it may just be two feet of water over it, but if you get a storm, then the extent of flooding is going to be far more significant across situate if it's not being absorbed by that marsh. So I think that's what the probabilistic model will indicate. So I think that's actually, for me, one of our priorities in addition to all of the other incredible recommendations and work that, that Josh put together. Um, as a side note, I'm glad you like the park. So I think um, we also, I used, uh, I just created depths. So for example, the, um, Northeast, actually, the Northeast Climate Science Center from UMass Amherst has done a tremendous amount of modeling and, and scientific projection work on climate change for the state. They are continuing to do so. So the, and that is described in the meat of this report as well. So they have done more sophisticated modeling like the Boston Harbor flood risk model, like the Massachusetts coast flood risk model, um, but they didn't have that spatial. So it's just kind of data points, numeric tabular data. Nonetheless, I took their projections and then I did um, create sort of a spatial like depths of that water over, um, over the harbor to try and so I looked at it both ways but really at the end of the day I think it makes more sense to kind of break it down into different depths at different intervals so when I was looking at it I would I created one to three one I actually at half foot intervals because it makes a difference So I'm not sure all of those references are in the report now. Josh and I were just talking before this call about we need to, we, we still have some work to do on this. <laughs> so I think the references in the footnotes is, will be part of it. But that's a, that's those are described in the, in the meat of the report. Good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. At, at the top of our to-do list is actually to get those citations in there, which are not currently in the draft. So. Okay, thanks. Du duly noted, Louise. And Louise, I, I will say just as in my experience of working with the town on this on this topic for a few years and, and almost always encountering that 
pushback on the science, um, a couple of things have worked for me in saying, let's try to solve the problem that you have today. And Winter Storm Riley is still in people's minds. And that's, that's a really good sort of experiential indicator for, I think, the public of what is to come not too far in the future. Um, Town's willingness to have these conversations has changed dramatically in the 25 years I've been doing this. When I would start <laughs> in the, when I would start in the late 90s, early 2000, and, and give talks on sea level rise, everybody was just about throwing rotten tomatoes at me. <clears throat> um, but uh, you know, Linda might remember those days. But um, uh, you know, it's 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 evolved quite a lot, and I think people realize that their eyes are not lying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, time has been going by. And if they start doing the math, you know, Darcy, on the one hand, 2038 sounds, you know, really far away. It's one of those years that'll never come. It's only 18 years I away. I know, that Holy doesn't Jesus. feel that far away anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know. It really doesn't. So, you know, I, I think people will be far more amenable to confronting, you know, what's out there. All right, I do have to jump off, but... Um, this has been fun. I'm looking forward to uh, reading the report and putting some comments in. Thanks so Good much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Thank you so much, Rick. See, yeah. I said it. I said Rick. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I uh, want to respect all of our time. So unless, does any, I will give another opportunity to open call if anyone else has any thoughts they'd like to share with the group. All good. Well, we, I will reiterate the invitation uh, and the gratitude uh, to spend a little of your time to look at the draft report and to give us some comments uh, because it really does help us polish things up and to see things from perspectives that we're not seeing things from. So that's really, really awesome if you can have the, take the time to do that for us. Um, I would just like to give accolades to Josh because he was really the mastermind in putting that whole report together. He did put all of that report together. So Christian and I fed him a lot of data and information and, and stuff. And um, it looks so fantastic because of, of his work and so much of his great thinking and putting it all together. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Josh. Great job. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Good job. Very impressive. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thanks for the time. Okay. Right, thanks, Thank everyone. Thank Night. You. Night. I like your haircut, Darcy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks.